everyone, thank you for joining today. Uh, this is Matt Britton. We have a very special webinar today because unlike every other state of the consumer webinar we have done since the onset of the pandemic in March, I actually have my guests here in person, live from Southampton, New York. Ken Ohashi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining Thanks us for having live. Me. I mean, we put this together. We both happen to be in the same area. Um, and given that we're friends and we've known each other for a while, we just thought it would be a great idea to actually do this together. Um, hopefully, this is a sign of happier days to come. Although, as we'll discuss today, there's still a lot of confusion out there as it relates to the Delta variant, as it relates to its impact on business and culture and society. So we're really going to dig in today. But Ken, I really just want to thank you uh, for joining. I know as a CEO of Brooks Brothers, you're probably very busy always, especially right now. How long have you been at Brooks Brothers for? So it's been a year. Okay. And it's, uh, describe the first year as a CEO of Brooks Brothers for our audience. Who uh, I can imagine that. I've just... A breath of emotions. Um, so Brooks Brothers, we purchased the company in, in the backdrop of COVID. And when you say we, you mean the, the uh, Authentic American. Brands Group uh -huh. and Simon Properties together uh -huh. purchased the company. Um, I was appointed president and CEO of uh, September okay. when we purchased the company. And we've been aggressively working to really turn around the business and stabilize the business. Um, and obviously, that wasn't easy in the backdrop of COVID. Of so when you reached out to me on this subject, I felt like it was so relevant for everything that I've experienced. Yeah. Um, and then also really, you know, being in a suiting business in the backdrop of COVID was not easy. So, you know, I think we're, um, things are better and, you know, I feel like we're, we're making some good headway on where they, we're, we're definitely on the other side of it. Um, but it is something that's, you know, continues to linger and stay on our minds. So I'm I sure. think this is so relevant for us. Well, first of all, it says something about you of taking on such a challenge to join a company known for its formal wear and known for its office wear, you know, during the heart of the pandemic when so many offices were closed and obviously you, you operate a global business, correct? So how yeah. many countries does Brooks Brothers yeah. do business in? So we're in over 30 countries right, right. now. Um, our Japan and China businesses are very, very large. We've been in Japan for 40 years. We're one of the first U.S. companies to enter Japan um, back in the 80s. And that business is doing really, really well. And obviously, we're in Europe, uh, India, and we're also in Mexico um, and South America as well. So we right. have a nice presence worldwide. Right. So although you know we're going to be talking primarily about the U.S. consumer today, you certainly have a global purview. And as we've seen at least with this pandemic, is that it's uneven, right? It's yeah. Distribution's uneven. Obviously, yeah. it started in China, and then it came over to the U.S., and then other countries, most recently India, had it really bad, and then they look like they're on the other side of the curve. And right. So it's just, it hasn't been even distribution, so I imagine that's presented both challenges and opportunities for you in running a global business. A hundred percent. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that's been great for us having the China businesses, it was sort of first at obviously having COVID, but then yeah. it was also first in the recovery. Right. So we really looked at the recovery of China to make some business decisions for the U.S. as well. So, yeah. you know, we have some learnings there. I'm sure. I'm sure. So let's dive in. Um, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, we are a real-time market research platform, uh, on-demand software that services over 300 enterprises to essentially put the voice of consumer in the hands of companies to empower every decision uh, you make throughout the product development lifecycle from innovation to product development, to packaging, to marketing, et cetera. And we did use our Suzy tool to conduct a variety of research, which is going to be fueling the presentation today uh, for this particular study that we're going to be talking about today. We conducted a study amongst a thousand Americans over August 4th and 5th. And the sample size we spoke to is directly, directly representative of U.S. consumers working from home and census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So with that, we thought we were out of the woods. Uh, in fact, the webinar today that we have planned was actually originally supposed to be about consumer electronics. We, our, our programming schedule for State of the Consumer was sort of trying to figure out a way we can kind of get out of pandemic-related content. And then obviously, uh, as we all know, uh, the Delta variant hit. And it hit pretty quickly. I think, you know, the, the summer gave us such a reprieve in June where, you know, I, and even May, I remember walking around New York City and it almost felt like it was over. Yeah. Um, and I mistakenly, sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong. We're saying on LinkedIn, this is over. Because again, I'm not an epidemiologist, nor do I play one on TV. Um, I thought that maybe this was going to be the end, but it isn't. And um, now, it doesn't mean that we're not coming out of this, but we certainly have been throwing a curveball with the Delta variant. And ultimately, I think what's creating more than anything else is just confusion. So while if I had to encapsulate people's feelings in March and April is fear, right? I think confusion is really what people feel right now, feel right now because they're seeing and hearing mixed messages, 
everywhere. Yeah. Uh, from store to store, from city to city, from network to network, nothing is really consistent. So that is okay in a summer month when people kind of do their own thing. But this fall was supposed to be the season we turned the corner. All offices open back up. All schools open back up. You know, but the virus doesn't care about the, the calendar year. They don't care about right. the calendar. It doesn't care about the calendar schedule. And that's really what's causing um, a lot of this confusion. You know, we have Nevada um, buying them uh, mask up again, and many other states are starting to talk about it. Um, Amazon just announced they're pushing back the return to office until at least January. Um, so many uh, companies and technology that were really bullish about reopening are now starting to slow it down and basically say, maybe we want to wait and see. I can tell you um, from Susie's standpoint, we were in the same boat like gung ho in S September to reopen. And now we're starting to look at what's happening out there. And, you know, we just want to make sure our, our employees are safe. And we do have employees with small children and, and babies that aren't vaccinated and, and, or elder or immunocompromised people. So there's just so many things that you need to consider. And obviously you have this ongoing debate about the vaccine. You know, it's completely split. Um, you know, it's become polarized. It's actually been polarized. This entire pandemic um, from the beginning has been a political issue. Vaccines have kind of hit at the heart of the politicization of this pandemic. And in many ways, it's political signaling whether you want to get vaccinated or you don't. And companies now are left with the unenviable task of trying to enter the political fray and basically having to put down business policies that can sometimes fly in the face of people's political or even religious beliefs. Yeah. So that's been something that we've never had to face. So, I mean, Ken, like, you know, the, many companies are now making people be vaccinated to come into the office. Yeah. Is that something Brooks Brothers is doing? And that's something that we're not doing at this point in time. Okay. I mean, we have 3,000 employees. We want to be consistent with our policies, both in stores and, right. you know, at corporate. Um, you know, one of the things that we are doing is we're watching the CDC very closely. So in areas where there are a lot of cases, um, which is, you know, which the CDC determines, uh -huh. um, we make sure that we mandate masks for all of our employees. So that's something that we're, we've been aggressively doing. And to your point, I mean, I think there's a contradiction of what we're saying versus where some governments, whether it's Florida, which are not requiring people to mask up. Yeah. Um, and it's a big debate, but our number one priority is to keep our employees safe. And we have not had any issues so far. Um, we're hearing from other retailers, though, that, you know, the, the COVID piece, the, the consumer continues to be resilient. But at the same time, you know, there are cases where store employees get COVID. And as a precautionary measure, you want to close down the store. You want to make sure that everyone is safe. So right. there is definitely some business disruption that's having happening in some of these hot spots across the country. And I can imagine, I mean, as a brand, as a national brand, Normally, you know, you want to be consistent from store to store, from market yeah. to market. But since cultures and government is inconsistent across yeah. the country, I can imagine sometimes it's hard to do that because yeah. what's normal in Florida may not be normal in New York or California yeah. or et cetera. So it's not an easy time to operate. And I didn't even think about the notion that you need to be consistent for all your employees in terms of your policy. So it's not just about who's coming to headquarters in New York, but it's about who's coming into your retail stores. Right. right. Exactly. Right. So that's that, that's a, that that definitely adds a wrinkle. You definitely ha do not have an easy job, my friend. Um, so obviously, you know, the Delta variant really exacerbated all of the vibes that we were seeing. Um, and it's something obviously that impacts everyone. So today, what we're really going to dive into is Delta's impacts on people's feelings and consumers plans for the fall. Right. That's ultimately what we're here to talk about is how does the Delta variant impact consumers um, intent? Uh, their purchasing behavior, uh, you know, the money that's going to come out of their wallet, um, all their activities um, from the work side to the play side, et cetera. Um, and we're calling it the fall of consumer confusion. I mean, um, you know, some with it's a kind of a double entendre, right? Because we thought it was going to be the falling of consumer confusion, meaning we finally get um, to a state where we knew where we were heading forward. But in reality, it, the season is actually the fall of consumer confusion because so many people don't know what to do. Uh, we ask consumers and one of two people feel their emotional state has been impacted by the Delta uh, variant, um, you know, to, to a certain extent. So it's definitely starting to enter the fray um, of consumers. People are definitely fearing uh, for their safety because depending upon what network you watch or what newspaper you read, um, you'll get varying levels of information that say if you should really be scared of this. And many people um, do have a fear of it. But to Ken's point, in some instances, it's impacting their behavior. But in others, um, it hasn't. 
Um, 72% of consumers say they plan to wear a mask in public settings uh, with the Delta variant. I can tell you here in New York, um, it was almost like a light switch turned on where you weren't seeing any masks in stores anywhere. And then one week, I think it was about two weeks ago, you start to see it over and over and over again. Yeah. Just, it's incredible how quickly yeah. things can actually change in that regard. Um, and now we're, as we look towards the fall, when you think of big fall events, you know, we're, there's already talk about, um, you know, face masks at this year's Met Gala, which is something that we might not have thought would actually be the case. Um, there's parents that feel strongly that both students and staff should wear masks at school. Um, parents of young kids, uh, you know, age five to 12, that go into school that can't be vaccinated. Many parents are fearful. Many teachers um, have a fear about the virus sort of uh, incubating within their um, classroom environments. Um, and Crayola, who was a, a, a client of ours and a company that really jumped on, um, you know, this pandemic as a, as a business opportunity, for lack of a better term, to service parents who are at home trying to entertain their kids, is now stepping on the gas again with with uh, branded masks and stuff, knowing that, especially for younger kids, they're more than likely going to have to wear a mask um, in school. And at a worst case scenario, people are anxious again that there could be some type of a shutdown. Now, Ken, you brought up a great point when we were chatting prior to this starting that the Delta variant in other markets kind of came and went. It was almost like a reverse V. Right? Yeah. Went away yeah. So. Yeah. So in our India business, obviously, you guys all know what happened in India, but it was a pretty short period of time. It was really kind of a six to eight week period where it peaked. And now the India business um, is starting to normalize. It and is. Yes. Wow. And we're sort of seeing the momentum come back. And what, one of the things that we've noticed in the business overall is there's a lot of pent up demand. We saw it in the China market. We saw it in the India market. And they caught like really the consumer comes back strong. Quickly. Right. Um, and I think one of the things with Brooks Brothers in particular, I mean, we're a luxury retailer and the majority of the people that are saving money during the period of time, you know, when things are shut down, tend to be the people with the highest disposable yeah, income. Yeah, about the K-shaped recovery all the time. And yeah. that luxury consumer really comes back very, very strong. They haven't been traveling. They haven't right. been eating out. Um, and so all of those savings really goes back into the economy. So it's interesting. We talked earlier about the unevenness of the pandemic. So in a market like India, when it's it's at its worst, right? Does does, you, does a business like Brooks Brothers just shut down? Shut down. You shut down. You shut down. Completely. So so basically, a couple of months ago or six weeks when it got India, you shut down. Then you see it go down. You look at the data. Do you guys have people on your staff that are just full time looking at this stuff? Like, how does a retailer get the right information to make these decisions? I mean, I think I I, I think the one thing about retail that's really great is like you have a lot of partners. I mean, if you think about it, we're constantly looking at what are some of the bigger boxes are doing? What's right. Walmart doing? What's Target's doing? You know, so we're kind of all in it together. We're all dealing with the same issues across the US and across the world. So I think you have a lot of partners in this. So there, there are a lot of resources, um, you know, out there that we, you know, talk to, we, we think about. Um, and ultimately, you know, for us, it's about the safety of our people and the safety of, of our consumers. So, you know, that's the most important thing. And that's what we, that's what we optimize for. Yeah. It's interesting because you, I mean, in some ways you've been through this now, like you saw what happened in India, you went through the process of shutting down and reopening. And if, if the U S should go through that same journey for lack of a better term, where it spikes and goes down, you kind of know the playbook. Right. So that's the, you know, I guess that's something that you can lean into. 61% um, of people are willing to reintroduce social distancing in some sort. So, you know, you have more than half of the country saying, okay, social distancing, if that's what we need to do to avoid shutting down, we don't want to shut down again. So again, consumers, the first time the notion of a shutdown got brought up or the first time the notion of even office closing, it was so crazy. It was such a foreign concept. But now we've almost been there, done that. So yeah. I think consumers all probably have masks in their drawer somewhere. They've all know how to use Zoom. So I think that learning curve for going to a more remote or social distance environment is nowhere near as, as steep as it was last March. Right. Right. So right. I think uh, it probably makes consumers a bit more flexible. Um, and, you know, one thing we've also seen is the Delta variant is helping uh, vaccine adoption for people who were hesitant as well. 33% um, of people have more positive view of vaccines since the onset. Um, of the Delta, if you want to call it a positive. Um, and basically all 50 states right now are reporting rising vaccination rates um, as a part of it. Um, and, you know, I think that this this notion of, you know, 
making employees get vaccinated to go into work to me is just fascinating. And, you know, I think there's, it's really hard to find the right answer to it, but something that definitely every uh, employer grapples with the government is grappling with it themselves and trying to get adoption. And, you know, that we're talking about uh, businesses and the government now incentivizing people, giving out gift cards, even giving out marijuana in some instances to get people essentially incentives to actually uh, get vaccinated. Um, and we do see now that one in three employers actually do plan to acquire vaccinations to enter in person office and location. So it actually um, is happening. So let's talk a little bit about the office, Ken, because yeah. when I think of Brooks Brothers, I think of uh, Don Draper. <laughs> I, think of, <laughs> I, I think of people like wearing nice suits and going yeah. into the office. Um, and when you told me that you were taking on the role in September of Brooks Brothers, I it's like it felt like you were going to the lion's den because, yeah. you know, but you guys have, first of all, done some pivoting with your with your, um, you know, allocation of your merchandise. Yeah. And I guess now you, you've gotten to leisure wear. Talk, yeah. Talk to about I mean, listen, we knew that the key to unlocking Brooks Brothers was to make it more of a lifestyle brand, not just a suit and tie brand. So if you go on brooksbrothers.com today, you'll see a lot more of a casual offering. So we like added sweatpants? like athleisure, we have wow. sweaters, we have knits, uh, we have rugby shirts. So really broadening the assortment, but not walking away from kind of our bread and butter, which is like the dress shirt and the suit that will always be there. Of course. But, um, we brought on a creative director named Michael uh, Bastion, who I hired even before we acquired the company. And he was, he's just been on fire. And um, yeah, like we went into athleisure and everyone was like, it's never going to work. Yeah. And it's been phenomenal for us. Right. To me, it's um, like Domino's pizza could never get me to, to eat their sushi. Yeah. Right. I would never eat Domino's pizza sushi. To me, I think of Brooks Brothers and athleisure and, you know, it's like so hard to, to basically comprehend that. But I guess if you execute well right. and, and people trust the brand, then why not? Right. I think you have to, you know, I think you have to do it in your own handwriting. So right. for us, it was about like a luxury athleisure program that other people didn't have. And the other thing yeah. is like we did things like putting monogram option to monogram your athleisure, right. which no one does. And now 25 percent of the wow. athleisure that we sell is actually monogram. So you don't really have that. And only 10 percent of our dress shirts are monogram. So more people, more of our customers are monogram their athleisure than their dress shirts, That's which incredible. is, is, is you, very, very interesting. You know that consumers would want to monogram their athleisure before doing it? Did you do your own form of research? We or? didn't. We didn't. I mean, I think we felt like, how can we make some, how can we make this product really feel like Brooks Brothers? Right. And monogramming is such an integral part brand. of it. Yeah. And right. so like we kind of put it through the filter and I'm sure there are a lot of marketing folks like on this call, but we put it through the filter and the vernacular of like what makes Brooks Brothers special. And we just went for it and it, and it, and it worked. So right. um, it's super exciting to see that casual side of the it's business incredible. really take off. And you know, I think one thing that we've seen during the pandemic is that companies who didn't, who weren't omnichannel, yeah. right, that just like Model Sporting Goods, right. um, they they went bankrupt because they didn't have a good enough online presence. Very Century tough. 21, a yeah. retailer in New York, bankruptcy because they didn't have an online presence. Yeah. You guys did. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and, and so talk to me about, I guess, with these shifts in every market around yeah. the world, yeah. shifting from retail to online, online to retail, has it impact your investment strategy? What have you learned throughout That's that? That's a great question. I mean, it's really been sort of yin yang. And I'm sure for a lot of companies out there, it's sort of been like, hey, you know, during the pandemic, our direct business really started to fly. And then now brick and mortar is like accelerating. Right. Um, our retail stores are significantly above plan right now. And we're seeing a lot of the traffic come back, which has been really nice to see. And our web business continues to be strong, but not at the rate it was during the pandemic. Right. right. Um, so there's a balancing that happens. Uh, I think one of the things that, you know, we talk a lot about omnichannel. So like, it doesn't matter where you buy the product, we can get it to you. Right. And I think that's what we've invested in. Right. Um, and making sure that we can get the product to the consumer, regardless of what channel they yeah. shop. And, and to your point, I mean, we did see... Uh, in the most recent earnings reports, companies like Shopify and Amazon say not exactly a slowdown, but the growth acceleration was going away as people return more traditional retail. Yeah. The question is, with the Delta variant, if it really does start to spread, we get into the cold weather months, is Amazon going to have the $120 billion you know, quarter that they had in the fourth quarter last year just because people are going to just want to revert to what they 
the, you know, what, yeah. what they're comfortable with. Maybe yeah. shop online, not going to cr- like right. you think about uh, Black Friday and what we used to see where people waited in line, like bashing down doors to get that $99 TV set. Are we going to see that again? What do you yeah. think about that? I think, I, you know, we're planning for something. I think it's going to be in the middle somewhere. Yeah. I think there are a lot of states right now where the consumer is not going back into the house and locking up. They are yeah. going to be out there and yeah. they're going to be strong. Yeah. Um, you know, our, sou- right. our Southeast region, which obviously COVID has the highest numbers there, has been consistently one of our strongest region, um, also fueled by tax free over mm-hmm. the last few weeks. You would think that the Delta accelerating would would kind of damper that, but it really didn't. Um, so I think you're going to see this sort of divide, yeah. um, you know, really happening. But again, you know, even in the Northeast, where I think you have people that are more sensitive to making sure that they mask up and they're vaccinated, you know, again, still people are still going out there shopping. So yeah. we're continuing to see it. Um, I think we're ready for both situations, but obviously, you know, we're, we're forging ahead as you a guys do anything with like buy online, pick up in store. Yes. And, yeah. It's Bopus. Yeah. yeah. We're launching that for the fall um, holiday season. Okay. Yeah. So that's something because we've seen with other retailers been very successful yeah. because you get, you know, the, some sort of immediacy. Uh, yeah. You don't have to maybe wait for it to be shipped, yeah. but you know, you also can maybe avoid the lines and the crowds and stores. So. Yeah. The other thing that we've been doing is really focusing on our concierge program. We have a consumer that, you know, spends a lot of money with us uh-huh. and they have a personal relationship with a lot of our salespeople. Right. So our salespeople will make an effort to make sure that that customer feels safe at, at right. all times. Uh, it's funny. I read a story recently that people going back to the office in fall, this fall, is going to be reminiscent of you going, of somebody going to school after a summer right. and figuring out what that outfit's going to be right. the first day because they've been gone for so long. A hundred percent. So is that sort of part of your method? Like, have you, how do you guys think about so that? So interesting. I mean, I think, I think that what we've noticed is the guy that likes to wear the suit likes to wear the suit. Right. Yeah. So right. like he's continuing to buy the suit, but he may on a Thursday and Friday be more casual than he usually yeah. is. Like we think that that's sort of going to be the mood, but you know, I think during, the pandemic, I think you and I talked about it. Like, are people just going to be in sweatpants for the rest of their lives? Probably and not. like, clearly that's not going to happen. Yeah. We're all social beings. We like to go out. We like to look, look good. Right. And we're seeing that happen. Yeah. So I don't, I don't think it's going to slow down. So again, you know, we want to make sure that we have the right fashion and we're continuing to make sure that we have a casual element into, um, in the business. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I personally seen that in the luxury category, not just in apparel, but being in Soho in May, lines around the block to get into Chanel, One hundred percent. I mean, Gucci, these, they, they can't get enough. And the luxury sector made such a strong rebound because people look at that as a form of expression. 100%. And, and it's something that they weren't able to really do and let everyone else see their beautiful things during the pandemic. So, yeah. that, and so you had the you know record high savings and that pent up demand. And then it kind of burst. And the question is, what's going to happen now? So it's, it's interesting to see. You know, we're obviously at this philosophical impasse right now um, as a country. You talk about the nation divided in terms of what to do with office, what to do with school. Um, you know, the debate is happening over and over. 30 percent of consumers uh, are saying they plan to pull back from recently resumed activities. Forty percent plan, to your point, plan to return to normal activities regardless of Delta. And then yeah. you were saying earlier, which I think is a great point, is sometimes there is a difference between what people do and what they say as well. Yeah. So you don't really know. I mean, in this polarized world, Sometimes people even filling out surveys are careful about what they want to say. We saw that happen in the, in the election right. with the polling right. where, you know, people, you know, when President Trump won in 2016, nobody thought that he would win because a lot of what came out, a lot of people did plan on voting for him, but they just didn't admit it in the polling. Uh, so, yeah. yeah and I think right. you and I were talking about this. I think people are really inconsistent right now yeah. because they're dislocated. So they may say like, I'm going to mask up and I'm not eating indoors, but then they find themselves in a situation where they're like, well, the window's open and it's sort of raining. So maybe I'll like right. eat indoors. And I think that there's a gray area that everyone is straddling right now yeah. or like for good reason, play dates with your kids that aren't unvaccinated. Like, is it okay if it's outside and unmasked? Yeah. Like, I think there's a lot of confusion to your point. And, right fati- now. and I think fatigue, I think right. it wears down after a while where you're like, you know what? You only live once. Screw right. it. I'm going to let my kids play with other kids. Like right. I think, Fatigue after a certain amount of time wears and people just want to do what they want to do. And and some people are willing to accept the risks that come with it. It's yeah. just, you know, we, you know, we were not too far away from a world where everybody smoked cigarettes, even though you knew it could cause cancer. So totally. they did that because yeah. it became habitual and they did it. So I think just because things could be potentially bad for you also doesn't mean people aren't going to do it. 
I mean, we've seen that. I also think that del the people that are vaccinated are like, okay, so my risk of hospitalization is low. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And oh, I'm not going to get as sick. What's the worst thing can happen? Right. Exactly. Right. So I think that mentality is starting to set in, especially with the government really focused on getting people vaccinated and talking about the benefits. Yeah. Of it. And they're talking about the benefits. And so it's really making people yeah. really feel like, okay, maybe I'll be okay if I get the I especially I think get like COVID. college campuses where, you know, maybe older uh, people and kids, they're not into the equation as much, right? right. College campuses, you're talking to 18 and 24 year olds. I think college campuses will be back uh, and it will look more like 2019. Right. Where if I, you ask me about a private school in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, I think it could look more like 2020. Right. So it just all depends upon, I think, the environment and the demographics um, are there. 72% um, of consumers say they put non-essential travel on hold due to the Delta variant. So we were talking about this earlier, Ken, and this is something where, you know, I was supposed to go to a wedding in August. It got canceled. So I think you're, you are starting to see it. Personally, for me, I'm hesitant booking travel for December if it's non-cancelable because I just don't know. Right. So I think people who might have booked travel for the summer, if things hadn't ramped back up yet the way they are now in certain markets, they probably went. But does that mean, you know, that family's planning that trip to Disney World over Christmas? Maybe not. I think that's yeah. the question. But you and I had a conversation. Do you remember, like, we talked about how this winter everyone's going to go travel on vacation. Yeah. Remember we booked our vacations like in March for the, for the back half of this year. Right. And then basically that's what I did. I mean, right. we're supposed to go, you know, to right. Puerto Rico right. in so December. So blocks. like that's right. locked. So, yeah. um, but I, I do think it's There's confusing right now. not canceling and booking. Right. So I think people probably aren't canceling what they've right. already booked, but I don't know if new people are going to book holiday travel. Right. Now. Right. You know, we'll see, but I would imagine if less people travel, it's probably good for your business because they spend more on, apparel and and you know it's interesting right we sell a lot of wedding suits right right how's and your wedding business now phenomenal right we don't see a slowdown there you go so right. um you know we would see it i think we would see it tail off like people that are getting alterations like canceling them prolonging them we haven't we haven't seen that yet so right. i think you know when left in the hands of most people to make the decision where they've waited for a wedding for a year or two yeah. it seems like anecdotally they're still forging ahead with it's it the wedding barometer is a big barometer because if you're canceling a wedding then you're really concerned, right? It's like such yeah. a big decision and right. such financial implications. So, you know, I'd be curious to talk to you and I will in September and October and just see how that changes. You yeah. know, and I hope for the people plan on getting married that everyone does have their wedding. It's just who who knows what's going to happen. And again, it's market by market. Um, you know, to your point, US airlines say the spread of COVID isn't deterring travels from booking flights. Although one of the airlines this morning said they are starting to see it. Um, this story was from July 22nd. Here we are in early August, August 11th, actually. God, time's flying. Um, and people are seeing it. So it is so very dynamic right now in terms of how quickly um, things are changing uh, with this. But, you know, to your point, weddings are back. So many people are lined up to book weddings. You know, the venues, uh, the event venues for September, October, November, for whether it be large conferences or weddings, they are completely jammed, yeah. completely booked. Everybody pushed to that date. Yeah. Every conference, every wedding, every event got booked September, October, this upcoming year. So we'll see what happens. How many move forward with it? How many don't, et cetera? It's yeah. just... Uh, definitely fascinating to see. 58% of people plan to limit activities with large groups of people. One thing that pops in my head with this is the National Football League, which is such an arbiter of American culture. It's the most watched live program on television amongst both male and female viewers. Huge advertisers like Coca-Cola and Budweiser uh, rely on it. You know, the Super Bowl is the most watched program live every single year in America, full stop. Um, it has such a big impact on American culture. How is the pandemic and, and the rise of Delta variant going to impact the NFL is a big question I have because they're sold out in so many of their markets because last year they you know, they had limited capacity of any capacity at NFL stadiums. That is, is going to be a big barometer, I right. think, for the country um, heading back because these are stadiums. Now, they are outdoors for the most part. But you're talking about 40, 50 in Dallas, 100,000 people yeah. in a stadium. Are people going to want to do that? My bet is actually they will. Right, I think for for because it's it, it could be an older um, demographic, aka like not kids coming, and I think that this is a passion point. That I think as long as the NFL goes forward with it, now ironically the NFL has really entered the political fray when it comes to vaccinations, basically telling players if you're not vaccinated, you can't travel with the team. There's all they're right. making it basically life way more miserable for people who are not vaccinated right. than vaccinated because they want to try to protect their players. Yeah. So very interesting um, as well. Um, Lollapalooza was a big 
big thing that just happened. So um, tens of thousands of people, pictures speak for themselves in a closed, uh, you know, closed area. People really um, went hell up who's a concert organizers for basically continuing to run with it. But they they're, they're saying they stayed within, uh, you know, state and city regulations and they were trying to run their business. I think these are the sorts of things that every business owner needs to be very cognizant of because there's on one hand, right, it's what's good for your business and your employees. And on the other hand, it's what about society, right? So like Lollapalooza, they went forward with Lollapalooza Music Festival in Chicago because all the people who bought tickets wanted to go. No one complained about going. They all wanted to go. And the organizers of the, con- of the country who had to cancel it last year needed to run the festival because they, they have a living to make. Right. But then from the outside looking in, you see this and it's different. So I guess that's the main question, I think, is there is what's good for your employees. There is what's good for business. And then there's what's good for society. And how do you actually balance that? Do you like as an executive team, talk about these things? Like, how oh, yeah. are these decisions made? Oh, yeah. I mean, we're constantly talking about what the... School, right? Yeah, I mean, you're constantly... And everybody has a different view, right? I mean, there's a wide... On my executive team, there's a wide range of viewpoints around this. But I think the one thing is, is that, you know, I think we are trying to follow, most importantly, what the CDC says, right? right? And we're trying to follow the guidance of the CDC right. um, more than anything. Which, theoretically, law of it did. Yeah, and, you know, I think that you can't get everything perfect right. um, in all this. And we're all learning. None of us can. And, you know, I think we're taking it week by week. I mean, we we're you were talking about earlier, we were supposed to go back to the office in September, but we are having, you know, conversations every other day about whether we recalibrate, whether we move to a more aggressive hybrid model, like how do we think about it? Right. Um, and then with our customers as well. I mean, we have you know, 15,000 um, customers walking through our doors every single week, right? So like, how do we really think about like the customer and keeping the customer safe? And then how do we work with the customer? Do we make them mass mandatory in our stores or do we not, you know? Yeah. So we're, we're constantly talking about this and, and thinking you know, about this. Yeah, and, and in that regard, you know, Jazz Fest said, we don't want any part of it. We saw what happened to the, for the organizers of um, La Palooza, so we're gonna cancel our festival. Yeah. It's the second year they're doing it. And the more and more businesses like this cancel, the, the less of a chance that they're gonna be around. Uh, for a long time at all. Um, over half of people said the amount they are shopping has not been affected by a Delta variant yet, but then again, some actually have. Um, we talked about the luxury goods sector, you go Armani bouncing back, um, and sales rose 34% in the first half. That's a huge number uh, for a company like that. Um, and costs are getting higher. So, you know, two questions I have for you on inflation. First of yeah. all, are you finding it hard to find staff, especially at the retail level? Right oh, now? yeah. A hundred percent. So what are you guys doing about that? I mean, I think the one thing that's been really a great advantage of ours is we're under a larger group called Spark. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, Spark has, call it 2,500 stores altogether. So we've been- Who are some of the other retailers? Um, uh, under the Spark umbrella is Forever 21, uh-huh. um, Aeropostale, Nautica, Lucky, and then it's Brooks Brothers. Right, so so part of this whole- Yeah, we're, right. we're part of a larger retail holding company. And that has allowed us to really sort of you know, look at the business holistically and look at the teams holistically. And that's been really, really helpful. Right. So basically, if you're short in staff in one market, you can basically yes. uh, borrow and, and move people around. And, you know, they basically are good enough to work in one store and good enough to work in the other exactly. so protocols, et cetera. So right. that helps. Let's talk about rising cost of goods, because that's the other, obviously, impact of inflation. Um, is it what is your supply chain like? How much more is expensive as goods? How does it impact your pricing, et cetera? It's real. I mean, it's real. I think everybody's feeling it. Um, it's not just the raw materials. The cotton prices are going up. Uh, the wool prices, the raw materials are going up. But it's also shipping, right? right? I think you're hearing this. Anyone that imports anything, it's very, very difficult to get a container to air the goods. Um, so there's massive delays there. There's even shortage of, of Costco wholesale, like has pallets. Everything is on pallets. There's shortages of pallets right now. Right. So it's a real problem. Um, we're trying to hold prices as best as we can because we believe that we want to give the customer the best prices. Um, so one of the strategies for us is just to make sure that we buy the inventory very tight so we don't have excess at the end of the season right. and, and we have to Buying mark it down. inventory tight in an unknown world, unknown demand must not be easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. I mean, I think, you know, there are certain areas like basics where we feel like comfortable buying deeper because it will... Go, and we, we can use it from multiple seasons, but on the fashion pieces, we're buying it very, very tight. We right. want to maintain the pricing. Right. And, and I, what is the lag time for you guys purchasing overseas 
inventory material for say holiday season is that already done oh it's done yeah we were lock and loaded i mean it used to be like okay if you gave you know the factories four to five months they were good we're giving the factories now projections out like a year in advance wow so we've definitely moved the entire product development cycle forward um right now with the teams um, i just thought we're finalizing fall of next year, wow. um, which we would have never done at this time. And we're definitely lengthening the calendar. And if you over sure. order, is there sort of like a reduced price, like off price? You have like an outlet. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We are, we're pretty well balanced between outlet and retail. Right. Um, and you know, it's like if you over order in the, in certain basic categories, you're going to be fine. fine. Right. Yeah. Like you fine. just can't take risk in, in other fashion categories. Right. And are there certain components in your products that are really hard to get at a price that's really yeah. high? Yeah. Madras out of India, very difficult. Right. Right. And like, that's a fabrication we really like. Um, that's been very, very difficult for us to get. So, wow. so I mean, being in retail is not easy. <laughs> it's not easy, but it's a lot of fun. I'm sure it's fun, but I just think about how many things you have to deal with between offline, online, you know, you, the retail staff, supply chain. There's just a lot to balance to get yeah. it right. Not to mention keeping the sanctity of a iconic brand, which yeah. is what Brooks Brothers is. So, you know, it, it, it's fascinating. Um, just moving on to some other topics. A quarter of people plan to stop dining, uh, doing indoor dining at restaurants. This is something where, Ken, to your point earlier about that sort of reverse spike. If it happens in the U.S. like it did with India, just looking at the calendar, hopefully by the time Northeast and some other cold, war, cold weather markets get cold, maybe it, it'll pass. Like, yeah. That's the hope. Um, I have a lot of friends in the hospitality industry, and they're fearing, you know, will we have to shut down our nightclubs? Will we have to shut down our restaurants yeah. in the winter? Yeah. They don't know if they could survive it again. Yeah. And, you know, is there going to be another stimulus package? I mean, this three trillion dollar infrastructure package is passing, but that is directed at different sectors. It's a, there's a, about electronic vehicles and a lot of other things, but it's not really meant to help hospitality. That would, those are the other stimulus packages. So that is kind of run out. So let's hope for that industry they can come back. I, I think one of the things that's interesting about the restaurant is, um, you know, there are a lot of restaurants you guys know that yeah. um, sort of are requiring vaccinations yeah. for their customers to be vaccinated yeah. in order to enter the restaurant, which yeah. is not something that we obviously had not even enter, but last one year. One of your favorite spots, Almond and Bridge Hampton, right. you know, we were there the other night and they require vaccination cards even to sit outside. That's right. Restaurant. Right. You know, so like right. they're, they're not taking any chances with right. it. So it's interesting in, in terms of how different restaurants, you know, try to make up their minds um you know new york city workers require workers customers to show um you know at least one dose of proof um and that's starting in september so there you go right there so here we go a quarter of consumers have put a hold on holiday plans for december um i think that's you know that hold on the plan is probably prudent just because i just think a lot of consumers don't know what to believe right now and they just don't want to be put in a position where they're not able to get a, ref a refund back for their hard earned money for booking a vacation or not actually able uh, to go on. Um, you know, last year we saw during Christmas, the one thing consumers did um, is they traveled. Uh, they want to be with their family for Thanksgiving and Christmas. That caused that big winter surge. We'll see if it happens again, but that is the part of the, the travel sector that I think may be invaluable this time around is people visiting friends and family. Yeah. It's one thing if you're going to Disney World and being around a lot of people, but if you want to go travel across the country to see family, I think many, many consumers probably will want to still do that. Right. Um, but, you know, again, that remains to be seen. 20% plan to stop shopping in person, every line delivery services. You know, you look at uh, categories like grocery and grocery, you know, a very small sliver uh, of consumers were buying groceries online and then boom, through the pandemic. Now you see companies like GoPuff being valued over $10 billion and you see Uber buying Drizzly, the alcohol delivery right. company and Instacart. Like it basically changed consumer psyche about a massive category. And now I think to my point earlier, they're far more likely to go back to those old habits because they know they can buy groceries online. Right. And they know it's easy and know they can trust right. it. So I think that's something that probably will change um, this time around. A lot of traditional CPG companies are now trying to figure out, as they have for a very long time, how they can go direct as well. Um, if you're selling snack food, if you're selling a, um, you know, a low involvement purchase, you can no longer rely, maybe, if consumers aren't going to convenience stores anymore to just throw in you know, a bag of chips during checkout. Um, so what do you do? Well, it's very hard to merchandise that way on an Amazon or even an Instacart. So a lot of um, you know, CPG, food and beverage manufacturers are starting to take measures in their own hands 
coming up are things like snacks.com, which is a Frito-Lay and, uh, you know, Quaker venture to basically sell products and snack boxes directly to consumers. So no matter what business you're in, whether you're in apparel like you are, Ken, or whether you're selling chips and soda, you know, everybody really has to be very on their feet, very dynamic about their strategy in this changing world, offline, online, on the yeah. channel, buy online, pick up the store. I think one big piece is just you need to understand what the consumer is thinking. You need to have some type of consumer data um, to basically understand where the demand is happening, how consumers are interacting. You guys, uh, you know, you obviously you source your own clothing and you sell the consumers directly. You have that first party consumer data. Companies that sell, uh, you know, uh, Pepsi or Doritos or any of the brands on the screen, traditionally they have sold through a Target or a Walmart or a Costco. Right. And when you do that, or even on Amazon, you don't get the first party data. So what we're starting to see with a lot of food and beverage companies, CPGs, they say, you know what, we need to figure out a way that we can capture consumer data so we understand where the demand is, we understand what the consumers want, we can target them more efficiently online, and that's why you're seeing a lot of these companies now adopt uh, this kind of direct-to-consumer channel, and that's why you see platforms like Shopify being one of the most valuable companies in the world because they're powering platforms like that. So that's just... Uh, it, it just goes to show every industry has its own problems grappling uh, with, you know, this really uncertain times. Um, this time around, people are planning to stock up but not to hoard. So one thing we did see during the pandemic is people stocking up on toilet paper. Remember that? It's like, <laughs> it was insane. Yeah. So people, are, we don't see that happening this time, but, you know, to the same extent. So this is one of our um, kind of survey respondents saying, I'm not stopping up on anything because I don't see any reason to. I don't live far from the grocery store and it's always open. So there's definitely more confidence in at least the supply chain for maybe the daily household goods, but consumers are buying a little bit extra because they do have that kind of PTSD of knowing I don't want to be you know, left out of my eggs or my milk or things I need. So maybe, or toilet paper. So maybe I'll buy a little bit more kind of uh, this time around. We are seeing mass sales as well. Um, this is interesting. So 20% now have uh, put purchasing a gym membership on hold. Um, it's interesting. What, what do you think? You think consumers are going to go back to the gym? Uh, are you a Peloton fan? I'm a, I'm a soul cycle okay. at home. And will um, you ever get a gym membership again? Oh, I have a gym membership. I'm, you know, will I you go, go to, again. I, I do go. Okay. Yeah. And will you continue to go? Yeah. To I mean, I have to say, Why do you go? I, I, I think the gym experience is a lot better for me. Right. Just from, you know, just, uh, I find it more motivating uh -huh. um, and I find more structure around it. Yeah. Um, you don't but have it's your been kids talking at you when you're right. trying to work out. But it's been incredible because I feel like the gym is very quiet. Right. Yeah. Right. So like during peak hours. So I think there's, I've definitely felt a pullback right. going to the gym day yeah. in and day out. So, you know, and, you know, we talked about Peloton, yep. a lot of these stay at home stocks, they continue to come back. So, um, in summary, we're going to go to QA. This has been, Obviously, a rapid fire, uh, as always, conversation. Um, there's definitely an ideological split, you know, in the U.S. Uh, whether you pause or push to return to normal, whether it's in schools, in offices, in retail location, in malls. There's, you know, it's ideological. It's uneven. It's uneven globally. It's uneven here in the U.S., creating lots of challenges for people in any sort of uh, business category. Um, brands really can't help people decide, but they can, to your point, can help people. Uh, keep safe. And I think, you know, it's following CDC guidelines, giving uh, consumers optionality, whether it's offline, online, um, you know, that is something that I think a lot of companies need to do, both with their employees and their customers. Um, you know, we are seeing, again, a lot of companies take a stand one way or the other, whether they're requiring vaccinations or masking. And I think we're going to continue to see it. We are seeing companies push back um, offices. We'll see what impact that has on you know, the, the business landscape, major cities, suit sales of Brooks Brothers, it's, it's kind of remains to be seen. But, you know, I think as we discuss, this is something that's very transient, um, at least as we see in other areas around the world. So we'll see um, how long it lasts. So um, I, you know, first of all, thank you for doing this. This is amazing. Let's, we're going to actually turn it over to questions right now. So let's see what type of questions we have. Uh, my trusty um, uh, assistant uh, who helps me with these webinars, Abel, is not a uh, available today. So normally he goes through the Q&A, but I'm going to take his role okay. uh, right now. I'm going to go through this. So the first question uh, we have, Ken, is do you see your supply chain changing as a result of COVID? So I think we spoke about that, but you know, are there plans to increase prices? I think you said you're going to keep them. At what point would you need to, you think? We're, we're going through it. I mean, I think we're really going to kind of look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Every single product, every single item, I don't want to raise prices. 
Um, obviously, that's the last thing that we want to do. Um, we're trying to buy smarter in a lot of places. So it's yet to be seen. I think our biggest challenge right now um, is just making sure we get the product on time um, and we capture sales. So that's the number one thing that I'm focused on right now. Yeah. Um, Susan asked, Susan B asked a question, do you see your value proposition changing? So in terms of your positioning yeah. to consumers, yeah. have you thought about changing the messaging or the look, tone and feel of your yeah. brand at all? Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I, I think one of the things that we've done is just overall, you know, that we've pulled back a lot on the sale message and we've offered, um, consumers, you know, if you buy two or more, you get a discount or if you buy to really incentivize the consumer to buy up and then get the discount. So that's worked really well for us. Um, when we first purchased the business during COVID, uh, we purchased the business with a lot of inventory and we had to be very, very promotional, but I think everybody was during that right, time. Right. And now because of the scarcity of demand, we've been able to really pull back on the sale message. Yeah. Overall. Makes sense. So this is a great question from Ram. Uh, hey Ram. Um, do you see uh, buy now, pay later? So we saw yeah. recently Square yeah. spent a third of yeah. their outstanding stock to purchase um, Afterpay. Um, and there's other companies like Affirm. We had somebody from Affirm on a recent Klarna. webinar. Klarna. Klarna, yeah. yeah. Is, is that part of you? I know you have a luxury consumer. Is that yeah. It, it, they seem to not uh, gravitate to that as much. It doesn't seem as relevant um, for the luxury positioning brands. I think it's obviously more relevant for some of the other brands um, in the larger Spark Holding Company. You know, such as Nautic, Aeropostale, you have a very, very price sensitive consumer there. Right. Uh, this is an interesting question from Michelle. Are you seeing a shift in personal style after two years in sweats or jeans over? Like, how, you know, what style shifts do you think are transient or permanent coming out of this? Interesting. I mean, you're wearing um, jeans. So they can't I'm wearing that jeans. Over you're a fashionable guy. Uh, so. <laughs> I, I think, you know what? I, I think the biggest trend that we're seeing is color people really, really attracting to color. So for example, you know, says blue, the two guys wearing black shirts. I know blue, <laughs> navy, blue, navy, uh, I'm sorry, navy, black and gray were sort of like the staples yeah. that represented over 50% of like, if you were to do a rollout, we're seeing a flip in that the consumer really wants fashion right now. Um, and we saw that really in the spring and summer months. So anything novelty, any fashion-y, they want to feel really optimistic. That's the trend that we're seeing in the marketplace. And we're really obviously pushing that. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, uh, this is, let's see if we have any other ones. I think we mentioned uh, a lot of them. Um, interested in hearing how consumers are responding to news in their shopping behavior. Yeah, we, we've discussed a lot of these things. So some of the questions we're getting, oh, here we go. Here's another one from Jim. How do you envision virtual, uh, this is a great one, Jim, and thank you. How do you envision incorporating virtual into the store experience? Oh, yeah. We're, yeah. It's, it's actually, there's a lot of cool uh, software right now where, you know, um, you can, Basically, you, you can call into a call center and it will be a complete virtual experience. So that's something that we so are. So you see how it looks on you? Or no, or basically, what? no, what's basically happening is it's, it's a combination. So one is, you know, there's, a, I guess when you were talking about virtual experience, it's like, how do you, how will you actually see the product? Yeah. That's something that, that is one thing we're exploring. What I was talking was, there's this technology right now where you can call into a call center and somebody can take you through a shopping experience oh, virtually wow. well, and like talk thing, to your product right. and be like, hey, this polo is a Pima Cotton. It's polo. your concierge service done remotely. Yeah. And, right. and virtually. So right. a lot of you don't really get a feel for the product. We actually have a very large consumer base that's still dying, dialing in and shopping by phone. And we want to make that experience more robust for that consumer. Oh, sure. Sure. So have you guys done any work with influencers uh you know like how, how are you looking at because obviously people of all income levels age groups are on yeah. social media yeah how do you guys look at that it, we're definitely using influencers um in it's, it's the new billboard right? right like in a lot of ways i mean we're finding people that really we feel like are aligned with the personal style right. of brooks brothers and you know obviously we seed them product but we bring them closer and we kind of give them the brooks brothers experience and you know that's that that's probably the biggest use for um, influencers right now. Yeah, for us. Okay, totally makes sense. Any other channels that that have been particularly, you know, and, and how involved you in as a CEO, like in terms of marketing channels and things Fair. like that? How do you spend your day? Like, what are the things that you focus on every day? Okay, so right now I spend the majority of my day trying to get the product in like on time because of all the supply so chain with issues. All your supplier, yeah, yeah, and then just really looking at forward-looking plans. You know, how are we thinking about spring? 
Um, how are we pivoting? How are we moving product around? I'm um, thinking about that. Obviously, you're reviewing design. Um, and then also the marketing piece is very important. Like, how do we take the beautiful assets that we create, whether it's campaign, and making sure that we put them in the right place? Right. Do we put them on Instagram? Do we put them on Facebook? Um, so, you know, that is something I spend a lot of time on because the traditional out of home billboard, it's how you interact with the consumer is completely different now than obviously. And you know that. Yes. So versus five years ago where you could have put a billboard or you could have focused on out of home. So how you access the consumer is very different. So we've been very careful about, you know, making sure that we invest in top of the funnel, but also invest in things that we actually think are driving ROAS and driving demand. So yeah. we have a balanced approach. Yeah. To digital marketing. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, one, one or two last questions about you, because I think people are probably curious to know, you're obviously very successful in your career. You're running a multi-billion dollar company as a CEO. What are some of the things that you think you've done right along your career path to kind of get you here? I know for you, you're like, oh, but like from the outsider, it's, it's a big deal what you do. And yeah. it's very aspirational to many people. And I would just love to know some of the steps that you've taken that you think helped you get here. Yeah, I think, you know, I I've, I sort of looked at my career as sort of like, you know, just trying everything. So I've had a number of different roles in various companies. I've worked in the finance side. I've worked in various sides. But really where I thought was really helpful was um, I worked for a, uh, Authentic Brands Group, who, you know, owns yeah. a lot of different brands. We did a lot of acquisitions. So really, you know, when we purchased the brand, we really thought about, like, what is the DNA of the brand and really untapping that and not trying to change the brand. And I right. think one of the things that's been great about Brooks Brothers is, you know, it has like an incredible story and incredible DNA. And like, how do we unlock that? And how do we modernize that? Yeah, is really huge. the conversation we're having versus being like, how do we change the positioning completely? And a lot of people come in and they immediately change the logo or they make these dramatic changes to the business. And most of the times, a lot of these brands have just gotten a rut where they're doing the same thing and they're not breaking out. Um, and that's probably where I, I feel like I got a lot of training. And when, right. I, when I took on Brooks, it wasn't really about changing Brooks. It was really about like, how do we bring out the shine in it again? Yeah. And that's yeah. how we're approaching it. Well, we're really excited to see what you're going to do next with it. We know that, uh, your job is not an easy one. It's been fascinating for me, at least personally hearing about all the individual things that you have to balance on an everyday basis. So first of all, thank you for doing this. Of course. It's been an honor. Um, and looking forward to hopefully having you back maybe after the holiday season to see how it went and see how great. It went, you know, we're all in touch. So uh, this has been amazing. For those of you who asked, we will be sharing the deck uh, of today's presentation as well as a video for anyone to download and share. So this has been amazing for everyone who's taken this hot summer day to uh, spend it with us and join the Save the Consumer Webinar. Thank you. Uh, we'll be back with more and many into the fall. So looking forward to continuing to give you guys uh, really insight of what's going on with the consumer. So on behalf of my friend and guest, Ken Ohashi, uh, and myself, Matt Britton, CEO of Susie, I just want to thank everybody for joining today, and we will be back in touch real soon. So take care, everyone, and until next time. Bye. Thank you.